Hello folks, Everchanger here, and welcome back to more Pokemon Blaze Black 2. Today is episode 80. Four-fifths of the way to a hundred. That is pretty insane. Last time, we concluded our exploration of Route 13. Well, not quite. There is a legendary Pokemon chilling out over there, and there is also a portion that we cannot actually access from this side. So, I guess the more proper way to say it would be, we concluded our exploration of Route 13 for the time being. And, this time on Pokemon Blaze Black 2, you might not think it, but we are actually about to have quite a plot-heavy episode right here. Pretty fitting for such a round number like 80. 80 strikes me as kind of 40's big brother because it's that big round number. I don't know what it is, but like 40, 80, when I get to 80, I'm like, whoa, we're at 80. I hope that's not just me. Anyway, let us now enter Lacunosa Town. Just saying, I love the music here. It's so good. Anyway, let's head down here. Hi there, David. Hee <laughs> hee. I used fly, so it looks like I beat you here. Thanks for your help in Reversal Mountain. If you go straight past Lacunosa Town, you'll reach Opelucid City. Ah, oh, finally. But before you go, there's something I want you two to hear. What is it? You'll know soon enough. Hurry now. Very interesting. Looks like Professor Juniper has some information for us. You must be the ones who want to hear that old tale about Lacunosa Town. That's right. Please tell us. All right, my dearies. Please, come in. Behind Lacunosa Town, there's a mighty big hole. And yes, many a jokes were made about this when the game first came out. Let's just gloss over that for five seconds, please. Have you heard of the Giant Chasm? Oh, I've heard that around the Giant Chasm, there have been brief temperature readings of minus 58 degrees Fahrenheit. Oddly specific, I'm pretty sure that was a nice round number in Celsius. That's what Cheren told me anyway. The road is blocked, so we can't get there right now. A long, long time ago, the giant chasm was created when a big meteorite fell from the sky. A really scary Pokémon was hidden inside that meteorite. A meteorite? When darkness falls over the land, this Pokémon appears. A frigid wind follows it. It freezes everything around and eats people and Pokémon. That's why everyone was afraid. The Pokémon ate people? So our ancestors surrounded the town with walls to prevent the Pokemon from getting inside the town. Also, a rule was made forbidding anyone to go outside after dark. Quick side note, this is a very, very interesting mechanic because this is the only town in the entire Pokemon world where the entire populace follows a sort of schedule such as this. If you come here after nightfall, there will be nobody outside. I find that really interesting. And that's the end of the old tale. A fascinating story. I'll add it to my research records. Everyone, we should be going. Yes, indeed, we should be going. Especially to go heal. Wasn't that an interesting folktale? The Pokémon's true identity may be unknown, but the power mentioned in the story is incredible. I know. The power to freeze everything around it could even rival the power of the legendary Dragon-type Pokémon. Yes, Bianca. It's almost like Zekrom, who scorched Unova with intense lightning long ago. By the way, David, do you remember the story of Zekrom? Personally, I do, but for the purposes of the Let's Play, I am going to say no. Oh, David. I even told you a little about it in Lentimus Town. Zekrom is a legendary Dragon-type Pokémon that lends its power to the person it recognizes as a hero pursuing ideals. It has a black body, and it can unleash fearsome lightning. 
Professor, do you think there's a connection between the Pokémon from the old story and the legendary Dragon-type Pokémon? The Meteorite. The Meteorite? Zekrom was revived from a rock called the Dark Stone. Let's suppose the Meteorite from the story and the stone are one and the same. Take into account that elements from the same era were found in Dragon Spiral Tower, where Zekrom was, and in the giant chasm. It doesn't prove anything, but it could be a piece of the puzzle. Let's not write it off as a coincidence just yet. If your theories are true, it should be a really strong Pokémon. What kind of a reason would there be for it to come out only at night? Like, if, like, it doesn't like sunlight, or something like that. Until we look into it more deeply, it would be hard to say anything about that. Now that I think about it, the name Lacunosa could be derived from Lacunosis clouds, which are clouds that resemble a net or a fence. I wonder if the name is related to the part of the story where they built walls to protect the town from that Pokémon. Sorry, I rambled on a bit, didn't I? David, could you ask Drayden about this if you get a chance? I'm going to do a little field work. Bianca, help out, okay? Sure thing. Oh, just so you know, Opelucid City's mayor, Drayden, wrestles with his Pokémon to toughen them up. Professor Juniper, wait up! Yep, you just gotta buff up that story about Drayden just a little bit more. Anyway, I am going to head into the Pokémon Center and heal because we definitely, definitely need to do that. Alrighty, very good. Now that we have done that, let's head out and explore the town a bit. That was a pretty smooth jump cut, right? Well, to admit something, I actually forgot to have my notes out for this area, so I had to quickly pull them up so I could find the items around here, because there are some NPCs that will give items. Right here, we have TM76 Bug Buzz, which is very nice. And if we head over to the Northeast House, we want to go inside, because because there is something worth checking out. Is that this house? No, it is not. This town is a little difficult to navigate just because of how it is laid out. It's kind of double layered. You can run around the top um, wall here and everything. As you can see, right over there, in the very distance, up in the tippy upper right corner, there is a cave entrance definitely worth keeping in mind for a little bit later on our journey. But anyway, in here we have a metronome. Very nice. Now there's supposed to be an NPC in here. Oh right, it has to be nighttime. Okay, if you come here at nighttime, there will be an NPC in this house that will give you an item every day, I believe, is how it works. He will give you a Lepaberry on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. And he will give you a Pekka Berry, or Pecha Berry, or Pecha Berry, or however you pronounce it, on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Really? Nothing on Sunday? Wow. I don't know, maybe Bulbapedia is a bit wrong on that, but they don't actually have anything listed for Sunday, which is funny, because in black and white he gave items out exclusively on Sunday. Seems a little odd, but anyway... That is actually everything worth finding in this area, so I think, without further ado, we will take a phone call, apparently. Hi, is this David? I am off today, so I was thinking I could pick up my cross transceiver, the one you've been keeping for me. Are you busy, David? Really? You aren't? Good. Can we meet at the Ferris Wheel in Nimbaza City? I'm looking forward to seeing you there, David. Goodbye. Well, this is an interesting diversion. This is actually the conclusion, well not the conclusion, but the conclusion of this portion of the Lost Item subquest. I'm pretty sure there was a spot where we could have received a call on Route 13, in which case we would have received this special call there, because this will occur after you have had 10 phone calls with the mysterious person on the other line. 
So I think just because we told her we aren't busy, man, I cannot stop voice cracking today. We are going to take a quick little detour over to Nimbaza City. Don't worry though, we still are going to do everything I plan to do in this episode. What you want to do is you want to head over this way to the Ferris wheel and you will have this NPC right here. No, I'm not who you think. What? You're David? I'm so sorry. I thought you were someone else. Well, uh, it's nice to meet you. I'm Yancey. You were different than I imagined, so I was a little surprised. Ha ha ha. I suppose so. We can just talk normally. Hee <laughs> hee. And we will hand over Yancey's dropped item. Worth noting, if you are playing as the female character, instead you will have a male NPC here named Curtis. Otherwise, the side quest is pretty much identical. Thank you, David. I'm sorry I couldn't pi find the time to pick it up earlier, but I really enjoyed talking with you, so maybe I was a little lucky. Ha ha ha. Um, if you don't mind, can I still call you sometime? Phew, I was really scared you might say no. And we register her in the cross transceiver, which basically means we just picked up a girl in a Pokemon game. Yep. Can I ask you one more thing? I called you on the cross transceiver too often, and my. I mean, one of my co workers got really mad at me. So, David, could you call me? What, really? Thanks. David, you're really nice. Hee <laughs> hee. I'm usually at work, and sometimes I have trouble picking up a signal, but I'd like it if you check your cross transceiver often and give me a call. Ha ha ha. Well, I'll be heading home. Goodbye, David. Yep, this is basically opening up a new little bit of a side quest for us. However, I don't think I'm going to cover it until after the main story is concluded, unless I'm sort of forced into it. So, I guess that's actually the... Jeez, what is with my voice today? I guess that's the end of the dropped item subquest for a while. But anyway, now that we've done that, let's just pick up where we left off. What's up? Have you seen Team Plasma anywhere around here? I heard a rumor to that effect. Oh, for crying out loud, this is troublesome indeed. My curious trainers. Perhaps I should satiate your curiosity somewhat. The reason I am still part of Team Plasma is this. I want to know how the world will change. Listen, Pokémon are nature. Pokéballs are civilization. Humans who, aren't who are used to civilization don't relinquish it easily. Of course, both nature and civilization are important. But what will happen to a world taken over by Team Plasma? People will be forced to throw out Pokéballs, a product of civilization. I want to know what that looks like, and I want to enjoy it. Shut your mouth. All I want is to get back a stolen Pokémon. David, give me a hand. You ready? You bet we are. Just to let you know. You're about to feel my rage! Here we go! We are now fighting... Team Plasma Zinzolin. The first non-grunt Team Plasma member we are fighting in our entire adventure, and quite fitting that we are doing it side by side with you. We need to avenge the loss of his sister's beloved Pokemon, and I think this is the best way to do it. So, I think we are going to open up with a Dragon Claw on that Swalot, because I'm going to trust Embor to go after that Cryogonal. Alrighty. Now, it has been quite a while since we last saw Team Plasma. We only had vague mentions of it before, and wow, that did a lot of damage. Ouch. Yikes. Ah oh well, Cryogonal takes a heavy hit from Hammer Arm and survives with a Focus Sash. Man, that was crazy. Just so you guys know, the Team Plasma plot is about to start picking up a little bit. Not to spoil anything, but it is not going to be another 30 episodes before we see them next. Not by a long shot. Anyway, I'm going to send out Victini right here. And I think think Victini will outspeed, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit that Swallow with a Flame Burst. Because... 
Swalot takes the hit, and then the Bursting Flame hits Cryogonal, and they both go down in one shot. Very nice. Alrighty. Gain experience for that. And next up, Zinzelin is bringing out Walrein, and his lackey is bringing out Crocodile. Little bit worrisome, because Psychic does Zilch on Crocodile, so I think what we are going to do instead is we are going to blast that Walrein with a Psychic, and hope Hugh will try and smash that Crocodile with a Hammer Arm. Unfortunately, we're taking a Toxic, which is... I don't want to say devastating, but quite unfortunate, and what is also unfortunate is Crocodile is avoiding damage. Dang. Alrighty. We got options here. I think if I were to switch, it would be bad, because that would make me incredibly vulnerable to Ice-type moves, so I think I am just going to... Well, let's try Zen Headbutt, see if it does more damage to Walrein. Well, I guess nothing is doing any damage to Walrein this turn. Hugh takes that dig. Can he survive it? No, not even close. And of course, the opponent's Crocodile has Moxie, which is an awesome ability. But unfortunately, when used against us, it can be pretty scary. Alrighty. Now, I suppose it is worth mentioning... Zinzelin actually appeared in the original Black and White, which is pretty interesting. He did not play as big of a role in that game as he plays here, as you might imagine, though. So, it's going to be interesting to see how a character that was pretty much a side character for all intents and purposes is going to be adapted into a fully-fledged member of the plot. Of course, I know what happens, but in case any of the viewers do not... Trust me, it gets pretty interesting going on from here on out. Anyway, it looks like this guy is actually doing pretty well at stalling us. I'm gonna fall back on Psychic and smack that substitute. Or not. And we are going to take a dig to the face to our Victini, which hurts pretty bad. This guy's actually putting up quite a fight. Alrighty, Moxie kicks in again, which is quite scary, because now it is at plus two attack. Which means its attack is nearly doubled, I think, so I think we're going to pull out the big guns and bring out Lucario. Alrighty. I'm going to hope Electric is going to aim for that substitute. I'm going to just smash Crocodile with an Aura Sphere. I'm getting really into this fight. Mainly because this is sort of the signal that Team Plasma means business, because you never fought Zinzelin in the original game, so fighting him here kinda gives you that, oh man, stuff just got real feeling. Anyway, Electric takes a hit, and of course, no one attacks the substitute still, so I think we're just gonna have to smack it with an Aura Sphere. If this doesn't break that substitute, I will be very surprised. Alrighty. The substitute fades. Another blizzard comes out, which at least Lucario is definitely going to survive. Electric does not. Alright, what's Hugh got up his sleeve next? I believe he comes pre-packaged with three Pokemon for this fight. Last up is Flygon, which is an absolutely awful matchup for this fight, so I guess we're just sort of going to have to carry him from here on out. Bam. Very good. Down goes Walrein. And Lucario gets level 65. Nice round number. And is trying to learn extreme speed. Looking over this, I don't think there's really much worth in learning Extreme Speed, even though it is quite strong and has priority. Lucario is already fast, and it gets stabbed from these two moves and not Extreme Speed, so I think we're going to skip out on it for now, at least. Alrighty, and Zinzelin actually still has one Pokémon left. Here we have Weavile. Although... Fair warning, don't expect this thing to survive, because due to its typing, it is quad weak to Aura Sphere.
Yeah, no chance there, pretty much. What a blunder to have made in front of Zinzalin. That pressure I felt from you just now. What was that? And wow, we got a lot of money. What's with these two? I'm battling alongside Zinzalin. This shouldn't be happening. These trainers remind me of that one from two years ago. More important, we must continue our search. Like that scientist said, it might be an Opelucid city. We'll play with you again later. Get back here! Eerie indeed. Very eerie indeed. After that crazy fight, I'm going to go head back and heal, and then we will continue our adventure. Now, I would normally end the video right now, but the next route we have to do is actually quite short. So I think we're just going to stick it into episode 80, just because it's very short and it'll probably take us less than 10 minutes to take out. This is Route 12. Bring out our dowsing machine, and it's already picking something up. Very nice. It is right over here. Rare candy. Very, very much worth picking up. And we also have this. A timer ball. Very nice. Also worth time to pick up. And up here... We have an ultra ball. Also worth picking up. Lots of items here. Now, one thing worth noting about this route, there are very, very few trainers on it. I'm pretty sure there are only three trainers on this entire route. Which is mainly why I wanted to stick it in this episode, because the next area we're going to be getting to after Route 12 is actually quite long, and I'd like to dedicate an entire episode into exploring it in full. So, even though this might seem like a bit of a change of pace and a bit of an episode extender, I think this is probably the best time to do it. Alrighty, so we're going to take down Mianfu right here. I've probably mentioned this in the past, but I feel like Mianfu and Mianxiao are very, very underrated Pokémon. I think they're awesome, but a lot of people tend to just gloss over them for some reason. Which I think is really disappointing. Because I really, really like them. Like, seriously. Design-wise and otherwise, I think they're really cool. Anyway, we have a pile of swine right here, which is pretty much taking what I throw at it. Let's see if Crunch will do any better. A little bit better. Take an Earthquake, which I'm pretty sure we're going to take like a Champ, which we do, and this Crunch should finish it off. And it doesn't, because of course it doesn't. Wow, critical hit. Ouch. Alright, correction. This Crunch should finish it off. There we go. And down goes the Battle Girl, Azra. Very nice. Alrighty. This is a route that I kind of like to explore zigzag style, because it's very wide, so I just like to zigzag across it just so I can scan every bit of area, because it's very wide and open. Trainer tips. Try pressing select while organizing your PC box. It'll let you move your Pokémon around more easily. The more Pokémon you deposit, the more boxes you'll have. Very nice. Right here, we have a stick. Which, if you have a Farfetch'd, is quite valuable. But if you do not have a Farfetch'd, it's really not worth anything at all. Although, honestly, I feel like Farfetch'd, even with the stick equipped, is still pretty much worthless as a Pokémon. Kind of unfortunate to say, but it's true. Oh wow, we have a Blaziken coming out here. That is a force to be reckoned with. Blaziken is extremely fast, extremely powerful. Let's see if we can dig it. Okay, we can dig it. Do you even dig it, bro? Alrighty, hopefully this will bring it down in one shot, because we cannot survive a Brave Bird from this thing. Blaziken is one of the most powerful Pokemon out there. Luckily, it does go down. And that is actually all the Pokemon this guy had. Awesome. Alrighty. Pressing onwards here, we have a couple of items right over here, free for the taking. We have a PP up, very nice. Joke about that as you will. And here we have a yellow shard. 
which is significantly less bait for jokes. And right here, we have another free item, a Max Repel. There's a lot of stuff hidden on this route. Now, I could have sworn there was a hidden grotto somewhere around here, or am I crazy about that? Maybe I am crazy. Oh well. Anyway, let's head over this very hilly route, and yeah, as you can see, we have one more pair of trainers right here, but I think that's pretty much it for this route already. So, here we have a double battle, which is something we haven't seen in a little while, I don't think. Well, no, what am I saying? We just did a double battle against Team Plasma. Man, I must be losing my mind. Anyhow, here we have Solrock and Lunatone. As I mentioned, they are double battle counterparts without the benefits that come from that. Anyway, we are going to try and bite Lunatone and Aurasphere Solrock. And I believe the Psychic neutralizes Rock's weakness. But it doesn't matter because down it goes anyway. Now, I don't think Rock neutralizes Dark, so this should be a super effective hit on Lunatone. And it is. Yeah, you see? That wasn't difficult at all. Lunatone and Solrock really aren't that much to write home about. Magnezone gets level 55, which is awesome, and we've already defeated this pair of trainers. Yeah. Anyway, right over here we have... TM93 Wild Charge. Very nice. And as we head over here, as you can see, we are already at the end of the route, so... Right on the other side of that gate, there is actually not an immediate opportunity to heal, at least not that I know of. So I am going to run back, heal, and meet you guys back here to end off the episode. Alrighty, here we are back where we were. I healed up our Pokémon, and I think we are going to end things off here. Normally, I would head through the gate, but I feel like the area beyond the gate is very atmospheric, and I think we should give it an introduction all of its own next time. So... This past episode of Pokemon Blaze Black 2, we entered Lacunosa Town and heard the legend of a very mysterious and very fearsome Pokemon that apparently came from outer space. Trust me, it's not what you think it is. And we also had a confrontation alongside Hugh with Team Plasma. And next time on Pokemon Blaze Black 2, we are going to be progressing further to the west to see what else the Univer region has to offer. Trust me, this next thing, probably one of my favorites. So without further ado, thank you all for watching, and I will see you guys next time.